so thankful for this day. It's, uh, Lord, we've had three souls come forward and, and be baptized this morning. Lord, I pray for them. I pray, Father, that uh, in the years to come, you'll use them in a mighty way to tell others the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we do this often. That's what you've called us to do. We thank you for those who've come. And Lord, now for our service this morning, i just so thankful for all in attendance, and I pray, Father, that as we sing these hymns and hear your message today, that all will come from the heart, not from the head. Be with us and guide us through this time of worship this day. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And I'm going to ask at this time if the choir will come up in an orderly fashion. Let's stand and sing. Thou didst, de didst leave thy throne. Let's sing this song now. We've sung it a few times called Yet Not I But Through Christ in Me.
sing a song called Somewhere in Your Silent Night. And as I looked at that, I, I, this is the song I wanted to pick out this morning to go with it, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. A lot of people nowadays are going through stuff, and they need hope. And this song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, tells us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And this choir song that we sing, Somewhere in Your Silent Night, I hope will bring you comfort if there's something you're going through in your silent night.
let's stand together now and sing a hymn. Hymn 330, Are You Washed in the Blood? opportunity to come into your house. We thank you for those who have come today to be baptized. Lord, for all in attendance today, I just pray for open hearts and minds. Lord God, uh, may we receive today what you have for us. I pray, Father, that the things of this world will not interfere, will not get in the way. Lord, as we hear your message today, may we take everything that you have for us through this message today. And may it be with us as we leave here. <coughs> may we spread what we get here today to others. Lord, they need to hear this message. They need to hear what we have. And I pray, Father God, that uh, you'll use each of us in a mighty way to, to tell others of the love of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we take up this offering today, May it be used in the same way, Father, to, to help finance and do all of the, the ministries of this church and beyond the walls. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. What a way to start a new year, amen? amen. I like to be able to do that every Sunday. <clears throat> I'm glad to see 2021 in the rearview mirror. I hope 2022 is better, don't you? It's not starting off that well, but hopefully it'll get a little bit better as we go forward. I've been telling you for the last four months, uh, since Nicole passed away, uh, we look, I look at things different. I'm assuming Miss Parker does. And uh, <clears throat> those thoughts are uh, the basis behind the message of today. And I give a simple title to the message is If. If you were told this week that you had one year to live, well, preacher, that's pretty morbid. We don't know what a year holds. If you'd have told me last January that Nicole would pass away this year, I wouldn't have believed it. If you'd have told Pam last year this time that Joel would pass away, I don't think she'd have believed it. If we'd told Donna her mom would pass away, I don't think she'd have believed it. We don't know the ifs in our life. What would you do if you were given that one-year sentence? What kind of changes do you think you'd make in your life? Would you change plans that you already have made? Miss Parker, she usually pesters me all week about what I'm going to preach on Sunday. I think she tries to get prepared for me. I'm not sure. But she it was on me this week about the message, and I just told her the title, If. Now, that, that can go a lot of places. And last night we was talking, I believe it was last night, and uh, I told her what the message basically is about. I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> I don't know who she's going with because the preacher ain't going, amen. That's the last year of her life. I'm not going to make that one. But I say that because that's what all the sports people say when they win the World Series or the Champions. I'm going to Disney World. But what would you plan or change in your life? Well, preacher, I really don't think I would change anything. You might be surprised what you would think differently after given that word. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse number 29. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse number 29. Now I'm just using the first half of the verse so don't get excited about the rest of it. But this I say brethren What's the next four words? Time is short. Now, if the Apostle Paul thought time was short, then what should we be thinking? Because it's 2,000 years on down the road since he was here. I'm going to suggest a couple things that we probably would think about, and then I'm going to uh, get to the message part that uh, I hope you will think about. If you were given that you just have one year to live, do you think you might consider how you spent the time that you have left? Do you think you'd waste any time? We would, we would busy ourselves, or some would, with the things of the life. <clears throat> now, I'm going, I'm going to keep referring back to Nicole. And I'm, I'm not trying to be morbid or to get you stirred up. <clears throat> If you're, if you're here for her service, uh, Dennis and Gaynell sang a song. If I knew today was the last day, and it goes on to say what they would do. I'd stay a little longer. I'd hold on a little tighter, and goes on through a, a lot of stuff. What would you do with those 
365 days as it relates to your time. Now, I don't know, but I guarantee you, well, I might not guarantee you, if they told Bud tomorrow that he had a year to live, I don't think he'd go to the plant and work for 365 days. Amen. <laughs> he said, my time's short. I'm going to enjoy what time I have left. Now, enjoys, relatively speaking, he's still married to Julie, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much fun he could have. Amen. But have you ever heard this statement? I'm trying to make up for lost time. Well, what does it mean to make up for lost time? It means you're trying to recoup some of that wasted time that you spend in your lifetime that you wished you had now to live another year. Most likely, you would begin to immediately... Count out the days, divide them up however you want to, ration them out, what you're going to do here and there and the other. But I promise you, you do it with great care and wisdom because you wouldn't want to waste one day. Now, after the service, and, uh, and, then, and everybody that sang did a great job. People said, uh, told me, Miss Parker, y'all did the, the best job that anybody could ever do. You missed the point of the song. It's not about the 46 years you had. It's about the one day you don't have. See, we can have the 46 years, but we all want one more day with that person. We will consider our time. I promise you the priorities of your life would change. The things that you think is important, Earning money, buying cars or property or whatever it is that you may do in this lifetime. But I do promise you those things that you have taken for granted for all your lifetime will become important. Family may not have been important until you get that one-year sentence. Your health may not have been important. Things that we take for granted because we think we have all the time in the world we will not take for granted anymore. How we use this last year of our life. Now, every one of us would react different. Now, I could ask you today, i say, Scotty, what would you do with that one year? And she could give me an answer. But she don't have that sentence. See, we don't know how we're going to respond until somebody tells us that you just have one year to live. Some would immediately start putting their house in order. You remember an old king in the Old Testament? God said, it's your time. And, uh, and he said, you need to put your house in order, get your affairs straightened out because you're going to die. And he went to the Lord in prayer, weeping and begging, and God gave him 14 more years. You remember a town called Nineveh? God said, you got 40 days, and I'm going to destroy you. And they repented. And God didn't destroy. See, how we act with that death sentence is important, not only to us, but to God. But some would immediately start taking care of their obligations. <clears throat> Others would begin to take uh, of the pleasures that they always wanted to do, but had put off. How many times have you heard people who retired at whatever age and within a year they were dead? They had put off all their life till retirement the things that they wanted to do. Listen, you're not guaranteed another year. Now you can put off the things that you want to do, but that may not be wise use of your time. I'm not telling you to go to Disney World or Dollywood or any place in between. What I'm telling you is some people will react that way. Some people will want to put their stuff in order and have all the stuff laid out that when they go, nobody has to worry about it. And others will pursue the things that they've always wanted to do, but they put off to some other date. And then there's those who will be totally paralyzed and won't do a thing because they're overwhelmed. Some, maybe even sitting here today, 
would start wanting to make right wrongs. People that you have been outs with or wronged or they've wronged you or you've wronged them, family problems, uh, children and parents estranged from each other. But when especially the parent gets that death sentence, what do you think they want to do? They don't want to leave this world with their kids mad at them. And if it's within their power to apologize or to make things right, guess what they're going to do? And sometimes children, if they get the news, they will want to go and make things right with mom and dad because none of us want to leave this world with anything that's not on the good side of the account, do we? Well, preacher, what are you trying to say to us? Faced with that stark reality that we just have one year to live, most of us would make major adjustments in our lives. I'm going to let you in on a secret. You're not promised another day, much less a year. Preacher. Now, this is the first Sunday in the new year. The purpose of this message, if I understand what God's trying to say to us, is this is your final opportunity to live like you should be living because this could be your final year. Now, I'm not saying it is your final year, but chances are by next January, the first son that's sitting here today will not be here. Oh, preacher. Some of you old. <laughs> but it may not be an old one that dies. Oh, preacher. Could it be that the things that we would change if we were given that one year sentence, do you think we might need to make those changes anyway? Now see, that's the point of the message. Listen, we're not guaranteed another year, but if there's things that you would change in your life, you might consider changing them. Because they're, or if they're important enough to change if you just have one year left, they're important enough to change if you got two years or five years or ten years because it's things that need to be changed in your life. Now, with that said, I'm going to give you some biblical things that you need to consider. Now, some of you will have to change because this is not your life approach. Some would have to make some changes because you're not totally committed to these things, and some would have to make a total and complete change. Well, preacher, what are those things? Look at Jude chapter number 1. Jude chapter number 1. Find the book of Revelation back up one little book. It's just one page consisting of one chapter. Verse number 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the com of common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. One thing that we need to do this year is to contend for the faith. Well, preacher, what in the world does that mean? Well, contending for the faith is doing everything that is within us to advance the gospel. Now, with that advancing the gospel, we have to be and should be willing to suffer if need be. But according to the Bible, we have to suffer with patience. Now, dear friends, if this is not the last year for you and you have another year, the world's going to keep getting worse and you need to be diligently sharing the good news with people that you come in contact with, but sometimes you will have to suffer. Well, preacher, I don't want to have to suffer. That's not an option. The Bible says if you're a true believer, you will suffer persecution in your life. People are not going to like it. Oh, preacher, I don't believe that's true. Ask the baker. Ask the florist. Ask the teachers. Asked everybody who stood up for their faith and would not do whatever they was wanting them to do, did they suffer persecution? And the answer is yes. 
Not only should we suffer patiently, but we should live courageously. Now, besides going to Disney World, Miss Parker said, I think I would witness more boldly. If I under, remember her words exactly, she'll straighten me out at home if I don't get exactly right. I would be more in your face with the gospel message. It takes courage to do that. For many of us, we have to back into the opportunity before we'll ever take advantage of sharing the gospel. If this is the last year that I have to live, I should be more courageous in, uh, 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 in your face. I don't mean being rude or arrogant or things like that, but be more uh, pinpointed to start the conversation and head it in that direction. And you should serve earnestly in doing it. Make it a, a major emphasis in your life. <clears throat> now, if I was to ask you, looking in the rearview mirror, how many of us contended for the faith last year? How many of us were bold enough to witness or testify or share a good news story, whatever it is that you want to call it, and suffered persecution because we did it? or mocked or made fun of? How many of us was that the driving emphasis in our life last year? Well, preacher, just stop and give the invitation. I wish I could. Now, I've been here 30 plus years. I've never preached to try to get you to come down the aisle. But I promise you, if you had one year to live, when the invitation time come, you would do something about your life. Are you listening? Number two, Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16. Verse number 15. Now, many of these things are interconnected, so it might sound like I'm going to repeat myself, but there's a little bit of difference in each one. First thing, contend for the faith. Be an active participant in God's program. Number two, proclaim the gospel. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Go ye into what? All the world and do what? Preach or proclaim the gospel to what? every creature, to everybody. So this year, if this is the last year that I have to live, it's the last year you have to live, the most important thing that we need to be focused on is going and telling who? Everybody. Well, what does everybody include? Everybody. Doesn't matter their sexual orientation. It doesn't matter their skin color. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. We should focus on proclaiming the gospel, the good news. Now, that encompasses from Genesis to Revelation. We live in a world that thinks that Jesus Christ just happened to pop into the world at one time. But listen, He's always been here. He was pre-earth, pre-creation. We've got to tell Him the story. Tell Him about His life on earth and the miracles and the wonders that He did, the things that He taught Tell them about his death and his burial and his resurrection. All that is part of the gospel. But it's a whole lot more than just witnessing to somebody. You need to become an instructor in those things. Well, preacher, what do you mean by that? I could stand here this morning and tell you the death, burial, and resurrection. I can tell you that he lived a sinless, perfect life. He was nailed to the cross. They took him off the cross and buried him in the grave. Three days, days later, God's miraculous power raised him from the dead, and he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. I can tell you that story, but that don't mean nothing to you unless you've experienced it. So what this is telling us is that we need to be instructor of people of what that means. What does it mean that Jesus was born of a virgin, 
that he lived a sinless life. Why was that important? Why is that important? You have to have the answer. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the message. Well, why did Jesus come to earth in the first place? Tell them. The world was in sin and in desperate need, and he came to set us free from that. You need to learn to instruct people. It's not a one-time shot. It may take six months, 12 months, 18 months. It may take a long time. But instructing them, they get the foundation they need to understand and know what Jesus Christ is about. And tell them what an advantage it is to accept Christ. And then invite them, invite them to come to Jesus. Invite them to church. Do something to add to the gospel that you've done that they may respond to it. In Luke 19, 13, it tells us to be about the Father's business. Engage in the business of the King of Kings until he comes back. Well, preacher, when's he coming back? It could be today. It could be this year, or it could be another 10 or 100 years or 1,000 years. I don't have a clue. But the instructions were, be about my business. Well, preacher, I work, and I have to go to the factory, or I have to go to the plant, or I have to go to this, that, or the other. But you still do the king's business. In the plant, you do the king's business. Well, preacher, I have to nail nails and hammer hammers and do all this stuff. yes. But you're doing the king's business. When that sweet old lady that works with you in the plant, she comes brokenhearted because her love, uh, her husband has forsaken her and walked out of her life. Listen, be the help that she needs. Or it could be a he, or it could be a they. I don't know. But life happens. Be about the king's business. Now the king's business involves all the stuff that we've talked about. But use the gifts and the talents that he's given you in the work that he's assigned for you to do. <clears throat> we need to equip people with answers. The world is looking for answers, and we have them. Or they're available to us, and we need to equip. Uh, through my, my phone I get all kinds of stuff but I'm fascinated by many of the surveys that come out and some of them is even by non-religious groups but the findings that they find when people respond to those surveys is astounding to me now listen oh, my, I, it may be even over 60% now of young people who grew up in church walk away from their faith. How is that possible? How is it possible for somebody that spent 16 years or 17 years, 18 years, however long it took them to get out of high school, how can they walk a faith away from their faith and the foundations that they supposedly got for 17 or 18 years? Because they didn't learn answers to the questions. And when confronted with the world and their theologies and their ideas, they don't know what to do. It's our fault. We did not equip them to answer the questions. Now listen, you've heard for 30 plus years, I've given you the answers. The answers are found in the scriptures, but we've got to be familiar with them enough to equip people to answer the questions. And I'm not here to preach on these things. I'm just illustrating. <clears throat> when a dear uh, personality on TV declares, there is more than one way to get to heaven, what is your answer? We all say, why? Well, tell me why it's no. See, we know the answer, but do we know the answer to give them when they question our answer?
Most people don't think they need a Savior. They don't need saving. Life is wonderful and fine the way it is. They're enjoying life. They don't need Him. Well, why do, why do I need a Savior? Well, back in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned, and because they sinned, sent it into the world, and God had to send a Savior because we couldn't fix it ourselves. You take them all the way back to Genesis and begin to explain why we needed Jesus Christ to come. If I was to ask you today, marriage is between a man and a... We all know the answer. Well, what if they ask you why? If two people love each other, why is it not okay? What's your answer? Well... The answer is found in Genesis. God created a and a woman, and he said, the woman shall leave her parents and cleave to his or her husband. Marriage was ordained by God in Genesis. Well, I just don't believe the book. Well, that's part of the problem. <clears throat> if you build upon the right foundation is God's Word. The wrong foundation is the words of man. And that's what is in turmoil today. It's the same thing that took place in Genesis. God said, you can eat of all the trees and enjoy them and have a happy life, but don't eat of the one tree. That's what God's Word says. And here comes the old sneaky serpent, and he said, did God really say that? They got, him, got Eve to question God's Word. And when he got her to question God's Word, she ate the fruit. Well, preacher, all the answers is found in Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 11 if you like to study it. We're going to do it again this year. The answers are there. The answers are there about marriage and salvation, about sex, about creation, morality, abortion. All those things can be answered in the book of Genesis. If you have the right foundation, you can answer their questions. Oh, but preacher, I've heard it's a woman's right. Study it. The minute that man and woman come together, the instant that seed is fertilized, at that moment that seed is a person. It has everything in that DNA that it needs. It is part of its mama. It is part of its daddy. But it is own individual person. And God said in His Word, Thou shalt not kill. Oh, but preacher, they won't believe it. They're on a different foundation. I can't help all what they believe, but we ought to know what we believe and why we believe it and be able to give an answer. Oh, but preacher, we need to make it our business to learn the answers. And that's why we're going to go back through Genesis again. I know we've talked through the book years ago. But we're going to do the first 11 chapters again. Because we're losing a generation. Matter of fact, we've already lost one generation. And we're working on losing the second generation. Because we got around. Oh, preacher. In the beginning, God. On day one and on day two and on day You know, all the story. Oh, but that means there could have been millions of years between day one and day two. Have you ever heard that? But God said it was morning and evening, and that was day one. When you start adding your opinions to what God says, you're wrong. And everybody that's teaching that garbage is wrong. Well, preacher, that's narrow-minded. I'm just going by what the book says. Amen. We have to know the answers because those precious people are going to die and go to hell because nobody confronted them with the truth and let them believe the lies of the enemy. Yeah, I spent more on that than I meant to. This is not easy. Well, preacher, the others have not been easy. But as Christians, as true believers, we need to be calling compromising Christians, church leaders, and academics back to the authority of God's Word. Amen, preacher. 
They've got away from the foundation that makes the church the church. And that's why the church is lukewarm today. It's because the church's preachers and the churches themselves have compromised God's word and they're not standing on that word and they're believing the lies of the enemy. And that's why the church is weak and anemic today. Oh, preacher, it's not. Well, read the book of Revelation. The last church age, he says, don't be lukewarm. And when your life is compromised because you have believed the lies, when a church is compromised because they don't stand on the Scriptures, when a preacher is not bold enough to stand in the pulpit and tell you what God says about it and show you out of the Scripture what God said about it, you become lukewarm. And God says, I want to spew you out. Oh, but preacher, most churches won't want to hear that. Now, I know all denominations are all different. There's... All kinds of beliefs, just like there's 18,000 different kinds of Baptists. But could you hear this preacher in the local Methodist church saying these things today? Well, why? Why would they not welcome the Word of God? Because they've compromised. They've let preachers come in and tell them, well, that's not really what God... God really didn't mean that when He said it. God means what He says and says what He means all the time. Amen, preacher. If this is our last year, we need to help raise a generation of young people to be salt and light in the dark world in which they're living. We need to teach the next generation the gospel and the Word of God and what it means and why it means it, that they can have an answer when that professor says. Or when their fellow classmates say they have an answer. Now you may not be able to convince them any different, but once you have given them the answer, it's their responsibility at that moment. Amen and amen. And lastly, like in the book of Ezekiel, God called Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 6. Ezekiel, I've called you to be a watchman. I've called you to be a watchman on the wall. Well, what's he watching for? He's not watching to see if the sun comes up. He's not watching to see if there's a beautiful sunset in the evening. He's watching for the enemy. He's watching for the enemy and his job is to warn the city that the enemy is coming. Prepare for battle. The enemy is coming. <coughs> Dear friends, he's called us to be watchmen in the world in which we live. Their enemy is coming. Do we even recognize who the enemy is? Now, I know I've got teachers in here. But the national organization of teachers is the enemy. I don't know if that's the proper name or not. They're the enemy. Their philosophies and their ideas is not what we want in our schools. Sometimes the President of the United States, sometimes the governor, sometimes the county commission, sometimes anybody in any office, in any state, in any land, they're the enemy. Well, what makes them the enemy? They're a Democrat. No! They're a Republican. No, what makes them an enemy is they're coming against the truth of God's Word. And we need to warn each other. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. Well, preacher, how do you know it's a lie? Because you've learned the answers in God's Word. And when somebody comes and tells you that this and this is the way it ought to be, no. Let me take you to Genesis. Let me take you to Genesis and explain well, if they're such a good, loving, compassionate God, why are they so much evil in the world? Let me take you to Genesis. In Genesis, start in verse 1, chapter 1, in the beneath God, and He created, run through the whole story, and after every statement, He said, it is good. And He got down at the end, and He said, it is very good. Listen, the world was good as God created it. You want to know why there's so much wickedness and evilness in this world? We're in it. And we have that sinful nature. And we have corrupted His creation. 
and it has become wicked and vile, even in his nostrils. And that's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Do you understand the importance? Now, we could all say amen to all the stuff that the preacher said. But we can turn a deaf ear and walk out the doors and not give it another thought. But let's go back to the beginning. What if? What if you were given? You just have one year to live. Well, preacher, I'll be checking out. None of that stuff will matter to me anymore. Mm. You must not have kids and grandkids. You must not have great-grandchildren. For the last couple years, we've been battling a virus. And it's took out some of our church members. It's took out some of your family members. It was classified as an enemy. And we need to fight it. And they poured millions and billions of dollars in fighting that virus. Listen, have we won yet? Oh, but preacher... I got my booster shot. I'm all right. I got my booster shot too. It don't mean nothing. But I can tell you that if we had known the future, if we had known that Cole's life would end last year, we would have done things differently. Not a matter of care and the stuff that parents do, but I'm talking about putting her through the stuff that we put her through. If we knew that was going to be the end, we would not have subjected her to all the stuff that she had to go through. We didn't know. We didn't know till two weeks, basically, before she passed away. Maybe we was, had her head in the clouds, I don't know. <clears throat> but the last trip that we took to the cancer center, and they told us the stuff that they told us. And they said, we're going to try this for two weeks, and we'll come back and we'll see what's happening. Now, you can ask Miss Parker. Her thought was, she won't be here in two weeks. See, we don't know. And it was within the two weeks that she passed away. Preacher, you're just trying to get on our emotion. I'm trying to get you to realize we don't have a clue how much time we have left. Don't waste what time we do have. Are you listening? Do you really believe that the church is in a battle? That we're battling a foe? It's unseen. It's a spiritual battle. These dear folks who are believing what they're believing are believing the deceptions that they have been taught all their life. They need a church that will tell them the truth. And in telling them the truth, you point them to Jesus, the one answer that they need for life. Amen. What if this is your last year? Would you do anything different? If you knew this was your last year, would you talk to that son or daughter? Would you talk to that grandchild? Would you talk to that great grand? Would you talk to that niece? Would you talk to that nephew? Would you talk to your husband? Would you talk to your wife? Would you talk to those people that you love if you knew you just had one year to live? Would you do anything to help them escape that awful place called hell? Well, dear friends, you don't have a promise of a year. This could be the last day that they live or that you live. And there's nothing worse than having regrets when death comes. <clears throat> if you've lost people in your life, uh, moms and dads and brothers and sisters, and in our case, uh, a daughter, <clears throat> your world changes. 
you don't think about things the way you used to think about them. And I can't imagine life not knowing that Nicole is with Jesus in heaven. You say, but preacher, she was special. Oh yeah, she was special. But if she would die, had died and not had a Savior, went to that awful place hell, do you think you could live with yourself? Preacher, you're just trying to make us feel guilty. No, I'm trying to get you to understand you don't have much time. As much as it hurts knowing that they're there, I can't imagine the grief of knowing that that loved one did not go to heaven when they died. And I'm being honest with you. Some sitting here, your husband or wife may spend eternity in hell because you did not. You have children that may not go to heaven because you did not. You may have grandchildren or great-grandchildren that will not make heaven because you did not. God's trying to put on the emergency brakes and remind us we don't have much time at best. Now listen, if I can make it to the 26th of this month, I'm going to be 72 years old. I understand. I don't have as much time left as I had. I wonder what would have changed if I lived every year like it was the last one. Hmm. Gives us something to think about, doesn't it? Every head bowed and every eye closed. In just a minute, but the ladies will come and lead us in the invitation hymn. As I said earlier in the message, I'm not trying to get you to come down the aisle. That's not the purpose. But dear friend, I, I want to suggest to you that if God spoke to you about something that needs to change in your life, if you just had one year to live, whatever it was, it could be all the things that we talked about or just one of the things that we talked about. Do you think it might not be a good thing to come and get on your face before God and say, God, help me to live this year as if it is my last year. Help me to be about those things that are of the most importance that my life can make an impact for you this year. Listen, you don't have to confess anything to the preacher. You can just come and kneel or sit on the front pew wherever you feel comfortable and just pour your heart out to God. Dear Father, we have tried to be faithful to what you laid on our heart for today. And Lord, it is hard for us to think about the end of life. It's hard for us to comprehend that we just may have a day or a month or a year because we are have desensitized ourselves to think that we've got all the time in the world. But God, through your word and your sweet Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring a Holy Ghost conviction upon all of our lives from the preacher to the sound room. That we will live differently this year for your honor and glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand and sing together. Would you come? I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to be obedient to the voice of God. Would you come?